uh, I got roped into doing this at the last minute, so it's kind of a rehash of a talk I gave at uh, ECCC um, in uh, Chicago in 2010. Um, updated for today, so there's a little bit of new stuff going on. Um, so, uh, I'm Nate, uh, I'm the person who designed the Zoom Floppy, and I worked with a bunch of people online, as well as uh, Jim Brain, who uh, did the board layout and does all the sales and fulfillment. So, uh, this is the story of how it happened. So, um, we'll talk a little bit about the Commodore Drive architecture, like what's actually inside a Commodore Drive, um, the older way of interfacing things with the old printer ports, and um, the sort of the new way with USB and how that evolved. So, um, if you're familiar with Commodore Drives, um, or if you're not, uh, here's a quick uh, recap. So, Commodore actually went way into the future when they started their first floppy drives and created a dual CPU computer inside the first floppy drives for the PET. Um, this actually had a, a CPU that was doing the decoding of GCR and uh, the one handling the drive mechanics. And uh, so, actually, the Z128 was not the first home computer with two CPUs, it was their disk drives. Um, and so the 2040 dual drive, for example, had a 6502, which was talking to the computer, the, the host site, uh, and a 6504, which did the GCR encoding and some of the drive control logic. And it had an IEEE uh, 488, or GKID interface to the PET, uh, which was a nice uh, parallel interface, so you had high-speed transfers between the drive and the computer. Um, one of the problems with that, though, was it's expensive. So Commodore being Price is the, another, the, the best form of optimization. Decided to make uh, simpler and cheaper disk drives. So this came with the 1540 and the 1541 and all the, these disks. Um, and uh, so what they did was they said, we can reduce the cost of the cables. Uh, apparently there was a problem with getting um, the GPIB cables for a while. They are expensive anyways. Um, so they came up with a simple IEC bus, which is a serial form of GPIB. And so it's um, Logically, to the, to the protocol you're talking over, it looks very similar to GPIB. The, the messages, the things you send are similar, but the data is transferred serially instead of in parallel. Um, so then, also, what they did was they took both halves of the ROM that they actually had two CPUs doing, merged them together into a single CPU with one running in interrupt mode so that they could handle um, both halves on a single 6502. And um, they built a little operating system with sort of a priority, <laughs> very simple operating system with a priority drive of the drive routines. Um, and then they improved on that by with the 1571 series by um, adding um, various kinds of um, different it, compatibility with like MFM format, um, dual sided uh, on, without flipping your disk over, and a few other improvements there. Um, one of the interesting things that they had was burst mode in the 1571. And uh, what, it, what got me interested in all this was copy protection schemes. So as a kid, it was fascinating to me that you could have a disk that you could read but not write. And uh, you know, if you know how computers work, it's they're not normally like that. Normally, if you can do thing one way, you can do it the other way. You just reverse everything. <laughs> so um, and normally you could save files and things. So I wondered how these things worked. And um, a good way I think to look at it is that every decent copy protection scheme comes down to asymmetry. So meaning that. You take advantage of something that works differently in one direction than work in the other direction. Usually things like um, uh, performance problems or hardware limitations or um, just design design issues. Some of them intentional, some of them not. In the case of Commodore drives, it was not intentional, but because it was cheap, uh, they had two kilobytes of RAM in the 1541 and 8K of ROM for all the routines. And um, there was no index hole sensor. But index hole sensor is if you ever look at a floppy disk, you'll see like a little pinhole in the side of the hub. And that was used on um, IBM drives and others for um, synchronizing to sector zero. So they would have an IR LED in the detector. They would say, oh, when the light passes through this little hole, that's sector zero. And so they would know to look for it. Well, Commodore doesn't have that. They have soft sectoring for that term. So soft sectoring is the sector itself tells you where you are. It's got a little header that says, I am sector zero. And you read some more, and you find another one that I am sector one. So you just kind of trust it. Um, so what people did was they went and built some things that took advantage of these, these different weaknesses or cheapnesses of the design. Um, so for example, um, people would do things like um, write the whole track in a custom format at the same time. So for example, you, you can have 8 kilobytes of data on an entire track, one revolution of a floppy. Um, 
but the, since the memory is only two kilobytes, if you were to go to try to write that out, normally when you save a file to the disk, it would go and save it piecemeal. So it would write out jump here and jump there, and it's designed such that you can just incrementally write a file. Um, but in the case of um, this copy protection, it was intentionally designed to make that difficult. And so uh, what they would do is they would write really short syncs and then uh, a continuous pattern of data to it using other machines, like a, what's called trace machine, which is a disk duplicator, um, or sometimes modified Commodore drives that they'd actually change the hardware out on. So to write an entire track at once. And the nice thing about that is um, when your drive is writing, it's also erasing at the same time right ahead of where it's writing. And so if you try to write things in piecemeal, you get what are called uh, splices in, in that, where when you turn on the erase head, it will erase whatever data is just in front of what you're writing. So if you try to like puzzle it together as it, it incrementally, you end up with little holes in your data that you put on the disk, or accidentally garbling stuff that you had intended to not overwrite. Um, so that was one reason why those are difficult to copy. Um, the track sync was another kind of um, protection that took advantage of this. What they did was um, they would do things like fat tracks with Activision uh, between track 34 and 35, where they would write the same data, but they would intentionally use hardware to align those tracks by using a drive that did have the index hole sensor. And so because of that, you could write data that was exactly aligned with each other across tracks and then bump the head between the two tracks. And if you find different data than what you expect it to as you bump the head, you know the two tracks are skewed differently with respect to each other. So, someone had not aligned them properly. And so in that case, um, you would fail the protection check. Um, and again, these, these two things are both examples of taking advantage of the hardware limitations of the drive. Um, so in order to copy these things, people um, wanted to actually copy the entire protection intact and not just crack it by removing the protection and rewriting the data. Uh, like John back there, big thumbs up for that. Um, built hardware mods. So some of the first hardware mods were things like uh, adding eight kilobytes drive RAM expansion. And so when you added this to your drive, you could copy the entire track of data into the drive memory, and then the drive could write that in all in one sequence without having to talk to the computer at the same time. Um, and then people also did a different mod, which was it didn't require adding RAM, um, but said they'd add a parallel cable to the drive where you could talk directly from the computer to the VIA chip, um, sending a byte at a time to it. And so you could actually uh, stream data over the expansion port from the Commodore 64 right into the drive as it's writing. So you could continuously be sending data. And that's because you could send data over that faster than you could over the serial bus that existed there. And finally, of course, you could add an index scale sensor in order to align your tracks or use software routines to try to detect unique patterns in one track and then quickly bump to the other one and write the proper amount of offset data to that one to hopefully get them close enough um, to within the head bump delay. Um, so uh, anyways, there was this project um, called um, MDIB, which then became DIB tools, that would do this um, on PCs as well. And so what you would do is you would you would do mod mods like this. So I've got here, I've got this drive over there if you want to see it, but um, I soldered on some of the cable to the via the, the chip in the bottom middle. Um, and that goes out to the connector that's on the drive lid. So that allows you to talk directly to the via chip. Um, and this also has the index hole sensor, which is sort of at the bottom right. So there's the parallel port cable. There's the index hole sensor added. Um, and I hooked it up so that you can read it in software. So, um, Modern day, people want to copy the data off of floppies onto their PCs for emulators or just to archive it. And so, I don't know if you guys use like the XA, XM, XE series of cables, um, but you'd have to plug it into a PC's printer port and then run custom software that would go and flip bits and read stuff in order to make that, um, in order to get data off of floppies. Um, and that's great because it would, the, piece, the printer port would give you low latency control over a bunch of bits at a time good for experimentation. The problem was, um, in modern PCs and laptops, anything after about 2003, 2004, uh, they either remove this port or they would um, cost reduce it such that you didn't have the low latency accesses. Instead, you'd write or read to it and there'd be some delay before it actually took effect. Because you didn't need that for printing. For printing, you just stream out a series of data. You don't care about latency. Um, and so because of, of, of those changes, um, it wasn't reliable anymore to use these things. So, um, the first USB interface was called the XU5041. It's still sold. Um, it's pretty cheap. It's easy to assemble yourself using through hole parts. Um, 
but uh, it has some real limitations. So number one, it's really slow. Um, it does a software USB stack, which means that in addition to talking to the drive, it's also decoding USB packets and even framing them, the bits and lagging signals across the USB bus. So uh, it's really slow. Um, and um, its parallel transfers, even though it supports the parallel port, are as slow as its serial transfers. And all of those are slower than the old printer cables. Um, and it really can't support parallel enabling because it's just, again, too slow for that. Um, it's, it was not easy to find for a while. Um, you could build it yourself, but there weren't people selling pre-assembled or kits for this. Um, and it didn't really work with copy protection either. So. Um, so I got into this, and I was using one, a computer with one of these printer cables uh, because I was flying to Japan and Korea a lot for work. And when you had 12 hours on a flight just sitting there, you could either do work, or sleep maybe, but, um, or you could do something fun. So I decided that to load Vice on my computer and take images of old floppies and crack them, basically, while I was on, on flight. Because um, it felt like doing a crossword puzzle. Yeah. You try to come up with a, the smallest patch you could do to crack these things, you know. And it was great. This completely self-contained in software, I'd have to carry hardware around for me to do this. Um, and I contributed a bunch of these fixes to nib tools, and then my PC died. So uh, at the same time, I found that there was this new hardware board in 2008 from Atmel that had a um, microcontroller, and it also had a hardware USB um, uh, peripheral built into it. And so this would handle the acceleration of you could just write to a buffer and control, do control messages and things like that with bulk transfers, and it would handle um, copying the data out the USB port at a higher speed. Um, without the CPU having to be involved in this. And so this looked like it was perfect to actually use me about this. Um, and so I bought a, a development board and then added a, a little, just packed on a, a port interface to it that actually interface with the parallel connector or the printer connector for um, the old X8 ports. And plugged it in, plugged it into my computer um, and uh, started messing with some software. And in 2009, I got it working basically. Um, you'd have to like unplug it and plug it back in if you interrupted anything. Um, it didn't really work with nibblers, uh, but two people built this thing and they, they verified that the basic design worked for them. Uh, then I went and built a new protocol on top of this that was designed to support nibbling and stuff like that. And um, I was traveling in Europe at the time. Um, and so uh, they had this board with me and I was just like writing code on the train and then like I tried it out when I got back to the hotel and it worked. Um, and so there's some, some cool things I added, or I had to add to this later, which was like um, like hold off. So if you work with USB, um, you don't have like a synchronous thing where you can send a message and expect like a message right back sometimes. You have to be able to just be able to wait forever for things to happen without locking up the whole computer. And so there are ways to sort of say, I'm going to go away and, and I'll come back to you later. And um, you don't want to also though have that be interrupted and then have it be stuck in a weird state where it, do it doesn't know that you're waiting for it. So I worked around that. Um, I had some level mismatch issues with 3.3 to 5 volts. Uh, Stephanie's familiar with that. Uh, and uh, I still only had two people using it. So I was like, okay, well maybe I'll build a daughter card. So I got this uh, pre-made board that was called Bumblebee. And this one had the same chip on it, but it was much smaller. Um, and I thought maybe I could build a little daughter board that you could plug this thing into and we sell the daughter boards to people. So I'm still coming, trying to come up with a way to package this without having to do too much work. Um, and so I put some prototypes together, it worked. We added a 7406 uh, for just isolating from the bus. Um, and Jim Braid over there said, um, okay, I'll, I'll build this um, if you want to. And uh, so he, he started in on it though, and he said, let's not do a daughter board, let's just take the same basic uh, microcontroller design, just put it on its own board and add the daughter board integrate the whole thing together into a single design. And so this was like a, this was one of the really old um, rat's nests uh, for, the, um, for the board. Uh, it had connectors for, or it has connectors for IEC. Uh, parallel it has like three parallel connectors because we weren't sure which one people were going to use. Um, it fit in the Hammond box, that's the standard thing, and uh, it is for sale. It's been for sale for a few years. Um, so after I, I gave this talk in 2010, uh, after that happened, we actually released it. Um, we later uh, 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 got the software finalized, and I read, wrote a nice manual for it, um, packaged it with an installer, kind of got everything together, um, and uh, Jim started selling it, and he still sells it today um, as a Zoom floppy. 
So the next thing we added was IEEE 488 support, so you could talk to your old pet drives as well. So um, I think the biggest problem with this was actually sourcing the connectors, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they were expensive, I think, or you had trouble finding them for a while. Yeah, you had to go overseas to find them and get expensive. Yeah, so you also had a header on that same port, I think, just in case you weren't able to find those connectors, you could solder a connector block onto it and then you know, be cheap. <laughs> the same problem that Commodore had back in the day. The reason why the cube flag is in the first place. <laughs> Yeah, so it turns out that some things never change. Um, so yeah, so what we did was um, this guy named Tommy uh, in Germany actually wrote the code for the uh, IEEE support. We were able to build an instance that could be auto-detected. So it would, when you first plug in the USB, um, I'm trying to remember how it was done, when you first start a transaction with it, it first checks to see does it look like there's an IEEE um, device on the bus. If so, then it switch to that mode. Otherwise, it goes to IEC mode and um, works with those signals. Um, and there's a bunch of connector pads for it. So that was cool. So now we have like pet drive support and um, nibbling with 1541 parallel cables and high speed stuff, and that was great. Um, and then I, I still wasn't happy though because I, I really like the idea of getting something that's completely like hands off. You, you don't have to know anything about computers to use it or hardware or whatever, or building cables or soldering. So I was like, let's get rid of the parallel cable. Um, I've been reading like the 1571 schematics, and I was like, wait a second, this thing goes 2 megahertz inside, just like the 128 does. So, um, that's kind of a weird thing about Commodore, was sometimes their floppy drives were actually more powerful than their computers, even though they primarily made computers. Um, and so, yeah, so inside the, the 1571, um, besides all the weird chips, like the chip to do MFM mode, uh, hardware index hole center, which was cool for doing the IBM format stuff, um, the MFM for that, um, they also had this two megahertz mode for the um, CIA chip, or for the whole drive of the CIA chip, but also get clocked at two megahertz when you switch into burst mode. So they created a burst mode that when you're in uh, Commodore 128, you can, you can sort of figure out in the bus it's a 1571, and then uh, activate burst mode, and the ROM will generate read the process that goes about 3.5 kilobytes a second using, um, uh, it has a shift register in the CIA chip, so you just write a byte to it and it clocks it out serially. Um, for you, again, freeing up the CPU to continue and other things, um, which is great. Um, but writes were still at the old 400 bytes a second rate, so I guess they ran out of time or something like that, or just sloppy or whatever, but they didn't really optimize it very well to what the hardware is capable of. And with the C64 and the 1541, you guys all know about how those are slow. Um, that was due to some hardware limitations where someone left some lines off the board, apparently. Um, and so the CIA chip on the computer couldn't talk to this the, over the um, or to the uh, to the um, to the computer. The lines weren't were there for it to write a byte to this register. Um, so anyway, um, because of that, uh, the one twenty had a chance to fix it, but they still didn't fix it very well. So um, I wanted to do nibbling though, but that's forty kilobytes a second. So I, I didn't know if the hardware is capable of it. Um, so I was like, did some calculations. We need. 40 kilobytes a second, so 25 microseconds a byte. Um, we need some time to be able to toggle some things and handshake to, to read bytes. Um, and it seemed to be possible that we could get up to 60,000 bytes a second with this uh, double clock drive. Um, so I took my oscilloscope out, and this is the actual trace for that, um, and just wrote some test code. Like, so I wrote drive code into the 1571, and then had it just toggle out, um, I think this is an FF, uh, um, yeah, um, on, uh, write, write that to it at, after bumping into two megahertz mode. And my biggest concern was whenever you have an external bus, especially, um, there's parasitic capacitance and other things on maybe ringing on the cable and stuff like that. So you never get a clean square wave out of something. Instead, you get like more of a sine wave or a sawtooth wave or something like that. In this case, uh, surprisingly enough, um, it, it actually works pretty well. You can see um, there's some ground bounce at the bottom where when it goes. Uh, pulls, pulls down, which undershoots past zero a little bit. That's a short spike. Um, there's no ringing that happens after that. And then um, when you release the line, it rises pretty fast. Um, and as you can see, it gets up to like 4.9 volts, almost almost five volts each time before you have to clock the next bit. Um, and so I did some checking uh, to make sure this was reliably detected enough as as clocked in as a one. Otherwise, you could get um, accidental zeros or whatever like that as, as if, if it was not matching the clock rate. Um, so this is apparently good enough. So it was it was great. So um, I uh, so I, I found um, uh, another guy online who was really interested in this stuff, and he was like a, a low-level assembly guy, and so he was really interested in um, writing this 
cycle accurate assembly in the 1571 drive that has like a bunch of like branches to knobs and things like that to sort of do cycle counting and stuff like that, such that um, it reads bytes from the computer, like if you're writing a disk, for example, um, and then toggles things out the, the, um, to, to, or writes things out to the drive. And then the other side, it uses the CIA port when you're, when you're reading things um, to like um, quickly read things off the, the, the drive register, GS, GCR, and then write it into the SDR register and then look for sync and stuff like that at, at higher speed. So it actually shifts into one, one, a different routine for 1571 mode than 1541 mode for the drive code. Um, so, um, so I've published this, of course, it's GPL, you can see it online. Um, it's part of OpenCVM, so if you uh, get the OpenCVM source code um, that has the firmware and also the, the, um, the computer the host side of it as well. Um, we implemented those features, so this is the slide here. But those are the people that worked on it um, and where you can get it. Um, so what's happened since then? So this is the new stuff. So um, that all happened by 20, uh, late 2011. We had the, the um, 1571 nibbling out, and um, I kind of got busy with life. Um, but then uh, some other people built some things. So this guy, Arne Minch, who, had been, who did the 1571 um, nibbling code, um, he built two peripherals. Uh, so the first one was the zoom tape. And this is a daughter board with, that fits onto the expansion connector of the zoom floppy. And uh, you just plug it in on top of it, and you plug it into a tape drive, and it will image the drive at, I don't even know what's the resolution it images at. So, so, some high rate of imaging thing. I've never built one or used it, but he was really big into this thing. And uh, so there's a compile time option for the firmware for the zoom floppy that if you, if you compile it in, um, you can take one of these boards, plug it in top, and then like image your tapes at really high resolution if you want to. Um, the other thing he built was a zoom RAM, and so um, what he did was he built an eight kilobyte extension, um, eight kilobyte uh, SRAM that he added to extension board on the, on the bus. And um, his concern here was that there was things things were tight timing wise on the firmware of, of the board because we have to be both managing the USB so we don't let that starve, and then also talking to the drive and handshaking things. So there's a lot of timing issues there. So there's a lot of work to overlap these two so that um, neither side is unhappy with us. Um, and so he didn't like that. It actually, there were some times when if you're writing a disk and it came across some conditions that would cause it to enter like a loop that was not infinite, but was running for too long, um, and caused a reset on the USB side of the bus because it looked like the board had hung up and not, wasn't doing anything. Um, so his solution for that was to like add some extra RAM so that you could just write the whole track at once and then the board would work detached, sort of like back in the day <laughs> when you would add that to the drive. Um, I didn't really like that because I didn't think that was necessary. Um, he actually went back to the drawing board, so in the bug fixes section, um, he, he looked into it some more and decided that there were more clever ways we could use the watchdog timer that was on the firmware, uh, on, on the microcontroller, to actually um, detect these conditions and then recover from it without the, the computer having to go away. So since we were able to fix that there and deal with the timing limitations there, there's not really a need for this peripheral, so he never ended up producing that. So what are we doing now? Um, there's a, a new thing that's on the horizon that uh, Jim's been working on. So in the spirit of constantly simplifying and making it easier to use and, and less work for people to work uh, to, to use, um, we came up with the microzoom floppy. And so this design is an evolution of it where instead of having to like solder a parallel cable into your drive and uh, cut a hole in the case to do stuff and things like that for the parallel connection, um, Instead, what you do is you just take out one socket and chip, the, the one of the vias, uh, you set this board into it, um, and then you put the via back in on top of it. And it's got a USB connector on that that you just route to the outside of your drive. And so now, instead of having to um, plug in two cables to your drive, an IEC and a parallel cable to it, um, you just plug in the USB cable directly to the drive. Um, and all the cabling is internal to that. This gets you a couple things that are kind of neat for free. Uh, the first one is it's a cleaner install because everything's inside the drive. Um, second of all, um, you get a parallel port without having to solder because you're just lifting a chip and um, the zoom floppy uh, chip can talk directly to the drive. The drives. Um, and finally, uh, you can do alternating access for both the IEC bus and the USB bus. So for this one, for example, let's say you've got a, this uh, drive plugged into both USB and into your C64 or 128 or something with IEC. 
um, when you do a command like list a directory or whatever, um, ZoomFloppy controller can isolate the drive while you're talking to it from the computer, um, talk to the drive, make it do its thing, and send the data back out in USB, and then um, let the via chip and, and, the, and the external IEC bus be reconnected back to the electronics as before, and likewise ignore the, the um, traffic on there when the counter is talking to the drive. So this allows subsequent access or sequential access to the same drive from two different hosts. So that's kind of a neat thing. Um, the current status of that is that we have a prototype board that you've designed and manufactured, um, and uh, we need to do some firmware testing and, and hacking, and there maybe need to be some hardware changes based on the results of that firmware stuff. So I've got a copy of it now, so I'm going to work on that when I get home. Um, after that, we've got some more reliability improvements, so that um, in the cases where people do have marginal disks, a lot of times you can have a disk that like has garbage data on or something like that, that can cause it to appear to be hung up, and again, things reset, so you have to start over. Um, so better ways to handle that. Uh, I want to do a new snazzier LED mode, where instead of uh, just flashing like, <laughs> like before, instead maybe it does some pulsing things or some other patterns like that. Um, that sounds fun. Um, and then finally, uh, on the software side and the workflow side, I think there's a lot to be done. Um, Michael had some good ideas about um, the retry logic. Uh, so what that happens right now, for example, for nib tools on that side, is like if it gets a, a sector errors in the track, it'll just retry and then see if they go away, and then retry again, and retry again. And that actually works pretty well um, for a lot of common cases where you have a disk that's collected a little bit of crud on the surface and it just gets wiped off by the head as it runs around a couple times. Um, but it, it's not very smart about it. So you can do things like take the best read rather than just take the last read that succeeded. Um, you could analyze the differences between reads and determine what was changing or what was the error, the type of errors, and have more uh, accuracy in the data that comes out. Um, I think there's some improvements to batch mode. I don't know if you ever tried to image a lot of disks, but it's a real pain to do that. It bumps the head every time you run it. But it does have a batch mode, but it's not really very useful. Um, and then finally, uh, for the speed of nibbling, um, there's a lot of things it does that aren't a big problem, again, when you're doing a single disk, but when you're doing lots and lots of disks, that adds up in terms of wasted time. Like, it spends a lot of time like reading the directory first, using DOS routines before it then goes and seeks to track one, and then bumps forward reading all, all, the, um, all the data from that. And it starts with a track bump before reading the directory, and then goes back to track one, so there's a lot of time spent moving the head around it. Uh, it could, you could do a lot more of that software rather than trying to use the drive routines um, so you can just bump, read the whole disk, and then in software figure out what the directory is <laughs> if you have the data now for it. Um, and the host computers are plenty fast to do that. So um, that's a brief recap of where we were and uh, where we're going with it. Um, and uh, definitely see me if you have any questions or ideas you'd like to see in the Commodore Drive interface stuff. Um, my big motivation in all this is just to get as many hands as possible so that people will take their old recipes, their diaries, their basic program they wrote when they were eight years old, and have a copy of it on their main computer that will last hopefully as long as they have backups of it there. Um, and that stuff won't be lost, and, and uh, maybe future generations might learn something from us. Sorry. Thank you.